Hi, my name's Chris Miller. I'm from here at NetApp. I'm going to be talking about uh, kernel synchronization and specifically about lockless synchronization. Um, so first we're going to talk about uh, the existing locking stuff, uh, just as kind of a background. We'll talk about some lockless techniques that are in FreeBSD and uh, when we want to use those and maybe some uh, final tips and takeaways. So we'll be using some terms that most of you should be familiar with. We'll be talking about reader threads. Uh, that's a thread that's executing code that's um, trying to read existing values um, in a protected data structure. A writer, that's a thread that's going to be modifying those data structures um, and critical sections, and that's the section of code that's running that's protected by the lock. So there's a couple kinds of uh, existing locks. Um, we have mutexes uh, and various types of shared locks, so we'll discuss those real quick first. Uh, so mutex is just locked or unlocked. Um, so either a thread is uh, executing in the critical section and no other threads can execute in that critical section, so that's good. Um, if you have structure, uh, structures that are mostly modified or being read and modified at the same time um, by a thread. Um, so every other thread is locked out. Um, so that's not good if you need um, something that's going to just be reading a thread or just reading a structure, right? If, so if a thread's going in and it just wants to read the data, um, no other threads would be able to read that data. So that's when we come up with um, shared locks. So if you have a shared lock, then multiple threads can read the same thing, and um, that's that's nice if you have a structure that's mostly being read. Um, so reading is not going to affect that data structure, so uh, multiple threads can read that data structure at the same time, no big deal. If a writer needs to come in and modify that data structure, then it needs to lock out the readers. and readers um, need to lock out the writer so that's okay and that's great um, until you start getting into high core um, systems like we have nowadays and then the synchronization just to do that starts causing problems so um, there's uh, several different kinds of um, shared locks there's SX locks which have uh, no priority propagation and the threads can sleep um, Read-write locks where the priority propagation is for the writers and the threads can't sleep. And then read mostly locks um, which have full priority propagation and the threads can't sleep. So now we can get into the lockless synchronization. And sometimes, um, as I discussed, uh, you don't even need um, you don't even need that shared lock, right? Uh, even that's overkill because uh, you get the, the that uh, problem with the with the high core counts and the synchronization between the cores. So with um, lock, lockless synchronization requirements, um, the readers can. Um, they need to be designed such that they um, are only so that um, the only thing that they need to be protected against is that data being deleted. Um, so they they really only need the data to stay valid or and not free. Um, and if the data is slightly out of date, that's okay too as long as they can keep reading the data and, um, and be protected from it being deleted. Um, you can use lockless synchronization for the writers if they only need to update one pointer to change the data structure. So um, the, because the pointer can be updated atomically, that uh, makes it safe. And um, then the, we, I said, you, Writers need protection against the data being freed, so the deleted elements um, are freed afterwards. 
Um, so this um, type of thing is perfect for singly linked lists where there's only one uh, data, one pointer that goes to the next element. And uh, those are heavily used in the network stack. So um, lockless synchronization is ideal for those kind of data structures. So how does that kind of work, right? So um, you can have a concurrent. So here we have uh, a concurrent reader and writer. Um, we start with a linked list that uh, the reader is traversing down the list. Um, and it's currently at element number two. Um, and then a writer decides that it's going to insert an element, uh, element three. Uh, the writer uh, creates that element and uh, populates all of the information in that element and then uh, sets, including setting the, po the next pointer that points to element four. And that's what we can see in that top uh, diagram there is that uh, the element three has been created. It's set to point to uh, element four and we have the reader uh, reading element two, and element two still points to element four also. Um, at this point, the writer can atomically update the next pointer from two so that it points to three now. So that's what we see in the bottom diagram, that two now points to three, and so that inserts three into the list. Um, and like I said, that's done atomically. So uh, the reader will either, depending on when it reads the next pointer, um, it will either see element three in that list or it will just not see element three because it read the next pointer prior to the update and it will uh, see element four as the next one. Either way, the reader sees a perfectly intact list. So then we can talk about that was that was the easy case, right? We were just inserting. <laughs> so what about deleting? Um, how can that be safe, right? So in that case, um, we start with a linked list, same sort of thing. Um, the reader is traversing the list. It's currently at element three. And we have a writer also pointing at element three. And it's deciding that it wants to delete that element three. Um, the writer can atomically update the next pointer so that it's um, of element two, so that it's gonna point to element four. So this rem atomically removes element three from the list. You can see the reader is still reading uh, element three. So we talked about that it needed to um, do the freeing later because the reader is still reading element three. So element three needs to stay valid. Um, and its next pointer needs to stay valid so that the reader can continue to traverse that list. So the, um, like I said, the next pointer is left intact. The reader can follow that next pointer and you still get to element four. And again, the reader still sees a completely intact list and the element three has been removed from the list, but depending on when the reader reads that point, um, it sees either a list of one, two, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five. Either way, it sees a perfectly intact list. Um, and like I said, element three is freed later. We'll talk about the word later in a minute. Um, so the concurrency kit um, provides the macros for doing all these atomic operations on lists and uh, queues. And those look like CK underscore whatever type it is, whether it's a list or a, a, a queue. And um, this is this just provides all the macros that we need for traversing the lists and updating the lists atomically. So you might still need a lock, right? This isn't going to be 
for everybody or for all situations. Um, and uh, it's important to know when you need a lock and when you can use the lock list, right? So you might need a lock um, if you need the list to stay consistent. So uh, if you want to read the list and then do something based on that reading of the list and modify the list after that or do a copy of the list or something along those lines where you need the list to stay consistent from across the whole concurrent section, you need to have a lock, right? Um, because the list can change during the lock list synchronization. So um, you also need a lock if you need to modify more than one thing. So I talked about that you can, you, the, the writer can only do it if it needs to update one pointer to make the change. We need to update multiple things like uh, generation count or a count of the number of elements in the list or something along those lines, we still need to have a lock. Um, if you need to modify more than one pointer, so like a doubly linked list, um, that would still need a lock. Although there are some exceptions to that, but basically if it's a doubly linked list and you can traverse it in either direction, then you need to have doubly linked, or you need to have a lock. Um, and then the elements themselves that are in the list are still need to be protected by the lock because those aren't updated atomically. It's just the list itself that's protected, not the elements within the list. So that's kind of important to understand too as you're using these um, lock list techniques to realize that the elements that are in that list still need to be protected individually. So one of the lock list techniques in FreeBSD is called EPIC. And so we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about that little asterisk on the word later. So this is kind of an over, oversimplified um, sequence diagram of how a reader and writer thread work with EPIC. So first, the reader thread enters a critical section by calling EPIC enter and it starts traversing the list that uh, is protected. And then uh, the writer can come in during that critical section and remove the element from the list as we showed in the previous diagrams. And um, then it uses uh, the call epic wait or alternatively epic call to schedule that um, deletion. And then once the reader thread is done in its critical section, it can call uh, epic exit to say that it's no longer reading that list. And then at that point, um, that says, okay, I'm done with that. You, you know, we're free to do the delete. So that's when the callback happens or epic wait enter uh, exits. And we can, at that point, safely free the, the memory from the, that was protected. So there's some complications. Like I said, that was oversimplified. So uh, you get complications of uh, what if there's multiple readers? So we don't have just one reader in that sequence diagram. There's multiple readers. That gets complicated. And what if um, do we? If there's multiple readers, do we need to wait for all the readers to finish? Uh, and what if those readers are overlapping? So that we constantly always have a reader. Um, and how do we finish one epic and start another? So those are all complications to that oversimplified diagram. So let's talk about those. This is kind of um, how we go from one epic to the next and when we determine that it's safe. Uh, so in this, um, we have the threads running horizontally here. Uh, we have reader threads that are R, and then we have a writer thread. Um, so the green sections here are the critical sections, and you can see that they're numbered based on um, the epic that they, where they start. And you can see that they overlap into another epic. Um, 
So we kind of, and this is one of the cases where we have multiple readers, um, they're overlapping, there's never a point where we don't have a reader happening, and, but we still need to do a write and remove an element from the list. Um, so you can see here that uh, the element is removed during epic n plus one. Uh, it's, so that's where we do the remove from the list. Um, and then a, a, a reader can be operating in two epics at a, at a, or across an epic boundary. So for instance, um, our reader three here would see, potentially have seen the element before it was removed um, at the beginning of its critical section and it doesn't end the critical section until it's in epic n plus two. So uh, we can't immediately free that memory um, until it's done. And then you can have um, something that was uh, going on in the previous epic, like reader four, that uh, now can read that element also or would have seen that previous element before it was removed from the list, and it may be relying on that element also. So in that case, um, you know, we need to wait until the, the next epic, which is epic n plus three. That's when it's technically free, or technically safe to call the free. Um, but what actually happens is there could be some uh, race conditions between multiple cores. And so the callback or the, the wait and the free actually happens uh, in the third epic, or the, the, yeah, the third epic afterwards. So that would be n plus four there where we see the callback happen. So you can see that in that previous diagram, it can possibly have to wait a while for uh, that callback to happen and that memory to free up. And if we have a lot of churn on memory, um, that can cause problems. So that's where the safe memory reclamation comes into play. It's called SMR. And that's basically because the epics are too slow to free the memory. So this is just another lockless synchronization technique very much like EPIC, but um, instead it's tightly coupled with UMA. Um, it's optimal for when elements are allocated and freed and reused very quickly. So um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the same problem with not wait and needing to wait for a long time for that element to potentially be free. So we're not leaving memory um, lying around. Uh, currently, it's used with INPCBs because they get allocated and freed very frequently. So this is a, just a um, slide showing the difference between them. Um, the critical sections for EPIC um, have been expanded in the, in the networking stack and now uh, basically cover the lifetime of a whole packet. Um, so those can, those can be pretty long running. Uh, SMR in comparison is short. Uh, it uses critical to create those critical sections, so um, it can't be preempted. Um, and uh, where EPIC can be preemptive. Uh, so because it can't be preempted, it can't wait on locks. Uh, and that's highlighted in red because that's kind of an issue and um, that makes, us, it makes a some complications with SMR. Uh, whereas with EPIC, you can wait on locks and that's safe to do in an EPIC section. Uh, they basically have the same kind of APIs for reading. They're named different things, but they're basically the same. Um, where EPIC has EPIC call and EPIC wait to wait for the writer to be safe, to do the memory reclamation in the free. Uh, with SMR, that's all tied into the UMA zone. Um, 
And like I said, with Epic, uh, it's not predictable when that memory reclamation would be safe. It's, you don't know, there's no guarantee on when we'll enter another Epic, when those turn over from one to the next. Um, with SMR, that's faster because it's tied with the UMA zone. So this is why we had the um, locking issue in red. Uh, we come up with a chicken egg problem kind of with SMR locking or locking th things with SMR. So I mentioned that um, the elements of the list are need to be protected by a lock. So if you're in a, if you're a reader thread and you need to um, walk your list, you're going to be using, say, SMR in this case. You're going to walk that list, and um, life's good. You're using SMR, and you can walk that list, lock list, but then you get to the element that you're interested in, and you need to lock it. Um, but like I said, SMR uses critical to establish those critical sections, and you can't lock or wait for um, anything there. So now you need to exit your SMR section in order to acquire that lock. But if you exit the XMR section, then the element might get freed. <laughs> so uh, we kind of have a chicken egg problem there, right? Um, so then we'll talk about uh, how that works or how, that, how we work around that. So we have uh, another function called um, SMR lock, which is designed to take a lock within an SMR section. And also uh, basically the same sort of thing in INP next, which is an iterator over INP CPs. Uh, in this case, um, we keep a lock on the previous element in the iteration. And we call this the anchor. That's pointed to by A. And you see the reader has a lock on element two, and that's its anchor. And it's also locking um, the, the next one, whether that's three or four. Uh, so in order to lock um, element three, we need to exit the SMR section. Um, at that point, the, that uh, element could be scheduled for deletion. Um, so if we see that that element is scheduled for deletion, then we need to not use that element, and that's where the anchor comes into play. So if that element's scheduled for deletion, then we can start over at the anchor. And that's why that anchor needs to stay locked. Uh, so we will go back to our element two. We'll follow the next pointer again. At this point, we see element four as the next pointer. Uh, since element four is our next pointer, we'll retry and try to get the lock for element four now. And then eventually that's successful and we've locked both. The fact that we've locked two elements um, is another complication. And that's what I show here, that we get complications from locking two elements, because if we're locking two elements, we could cause deadlocks. The fact that INP next um, always walks lists in the same order implies a lock order, but it's not enforced. These are some other places where we multiply lock INPCBs that could cause problems. Um, the new, when we get new TCP connections, uh, we have the head connection locked, and then we lock the new child socket that's coming in. Um, so that can cause, um, potentially cause issues. Um, up calls could, uh, try to do send and receive on other connections. And um, if INPCBs are in different orders in different lists, so uh, we can also 
walk the hash list um, or the all INPCB list. And so potentially two INP next um, calls could deadlock with each other if one was walking the hash list and the one was locking the list of all NPCBs. And if those are those INPCBs are not in the same order in both lists, we could cause a deadlock there. So um, here's what we could do to improve stuff. <laughs> um, documentation. Learning all this uh, about how these lock list techniques work and some of the caveats and, and drawbacks um, was relatively difficult. Um, mostly get that from walking through the code and looking at comments. We don't have a good just overall documentation of this kind of stuff and how they work under the covers. There's some documentation on how to use them, but not really how they work that gives you information about the caveats of the, and the drawbacks to them. Um, we still have multiple writers. Um, many of the writers in the system still need to use a lock um, because of they need to update multiple things. Um, like generation counts and, and lock uh, and a number of elements in the list and that kind of stuff. So if we could modify those so that that information is all kept in one place and, and not needed by a lock, then that would be good. And we could do more more pure lockless. Um, the, hopefully we'd be able to combine the benefits of SMR with the benefits of EPIC, and we could have a preemptive version of SMR that would get rid of a lot of these complications. The complications of having uh, multiple items locked, et cetera, um, would be solved if we could have a preemptive uh, SMR. And if we had preemptive SMR, it would essentially kind of uh, be the same sort of thing as EPIC. The other option might be to make EPIC so that it uh, regenerates the epic number faster. If we did that, then maybe we wouldn't need SMR, since SMR basically uh, fixed the problem with epic not um, freeing memory quick enough. So that's, um, that's all I had for today. Uh, any questions? Yes? You talked about how the hash list and the uh, all list might be in different order. So how do you actually deal with that so as not to get in trouble? So I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, <laughs> right now, I haven't seen that actually cause a problem. Uh, it's, and that's why I said that it was theoretical. Um, I think for the most part, we're lucky that the things that are in the hash list are also in the same order as the all list. Um, depending on when you do bind and, and connect, um, they could go in in different orders than they are in the all list. But that's a good question. I think that's an open, that's an open issue. I, I have not been able to prove that that's an issue, but just looking at the code and knowing when things get inserted into the hash list versus the list of all INPCBs, it should be theoretically um, possible to, to create a deadlock there. I noticed in uh, one of the early slides uh, you were saying the read mostly lock um, cannot, cannot uh, sleep, but you had an asterisk. Good question. Um, yes, I had an asterisk next to the cannot sleep. Um, if, you, if you can make uh, read mostly locks um, to be sleepable, if you do create read mostly locks that are sleepable, they basically become the same thing as an SX lock. And so they follow the same rules as an SX lock at that point. So that's why I said they can't sleep, but um, because if you create them as sleepable, they're essentially not, they're not the same sort of thing as a read mostly lock at that point. I actually have answer to Kirk's question. <laughs>
so the what normal connect is done, both lists are in the same order. And the only way to get it theoretically, I, I never have uh, was able to make that, to make them in the reverse order is that application first binds and then connects. So that I want to bind from that, I want to sit on that port, but not listen and then connect. Very few applications do that. Uh, so, so this problem is mostly theoretical, but but it is real. Any more? Okay. Thank you very much.